It was during a time that was very similar, actually, because it was in the late uh -huh. 70s. There were many, many um, hugely difficult economic issues and, mm. and geopolitical issues going on in the U.S. back in 78. And that's about the time when I kind of came to and started reading a lot of stuff. And, mm -hmm. and, and then I took a look at things and I noticed, wait, people are kind of stuck in these tracks. Um, but it's become increasingly worse over the years. Um, mm. And I, I kind of hang around with a lot of people on the internet that are associated with Jordan Peterson's ideas. And one of those guys is Paul Vanderclay. Okay. And he's been doing a lot of YouTubes about the meaning crisis, trying to mm. figure out the meaning crisis. And jo John Verbeke has been doing a lot of things about the meaning crisis as well. And certainly over my lifetime, this meaning crisis has gotten more and more and more exacerbated until I would mm -hmm. say, you know, we are totally, we're in it now, baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, you have these these two polarized ideas and without love mm. there's no way that those two people can communicate with each other but love says i'm going to accept you as a person mm -hmm. regardless of what your ideas are because yep. i want to really know you mm -hmm. not just your ideas i want to really know you yeah and um um there's this really interesting verse in the New Testament, John chapter 10, verse 24, mm -hmm. where they've come to Jesus and they say to him, this is kind of the Greek translation that I like, <clears throat> how long are you going to keep us suspended between two, how long are you going to keep our souls suspended between two options? Mm. Tell us, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Mm -hmm. And and I sort of saw that as, wow, that was that that was Christ's superpower, really. I mean, <laughs> he had many, but but it was his um, it was his gift to us that he could open up this space where two things could exist, exist simultaneously. simultaneously. Yeah. So they Paradox. didn't know if he was the Christ or wasn't the Christ. But yeah. if he said, I am the Christ, they would have judged him for saying right. I am the Christ. And if he had said, I am not the Christ, they would have judged him for saying, I am not the Christ. But because they didn't know, they could. Here's what happens when you withhold judgment. Mm. When you judge, then all your emotions get triggered. Oh, he believes that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Therefore, you're in this box. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. All, and, all, and all your emotions get triggered. You get flooded. You mm -hmm. can't think anymore. But when you're not in a judging state, but you're in a loving state, mm -hmm. you're fully capable of thinking things through. You can be reasonable. You can be logical when you're yeah. in that open state, right? You can also depersonalize a lot of things because you understand that your sense of self-worth is not predicated upon someone agreeing with your opinion because it transcends that opinion itself like it's that's that's not where your your self-worth is not found in your ability to hold the right opinions about you know there's something more uh rooted and transcendent simultaneously um that i think a, a human being's self-worth can be found in and again that's something else that hasn't really that in order to know that that requires an education um, people have to be actually be taught that and people haven't been taught that um people haven't been taught like to have a sense of internal worthiness um within themselves um and so they are seeking everywhere for validation and especially i think in politics they're they're seeking for sort of an affirmation of the meaning of their own life in politics which is why you see a lot of the large visceral and rageful shouting matches that are going on in our polarized politics today um all of this it represents an imbalance of the spirit and a and a and a failure to recognize um the eternal worthiness of oneself and of course that can that can redound to the community and to the nation um and you know this goes back to the idea of the artist like i you know i dj my dj name or moniker is paradox this I, and it goes back to this idea of being able to hold simultaneous 
concepts at the same time and play in that space um, and understand that. And, and this goes back to the archetype of the hero, right? The hero is, as I said earlier, the product of both the benevolent mother and the benevolent father combining those two things together, combining those two spaces together. So, so yeah, I just, uh, there, there's a lot of basic things that are taught in developmental psychology about, you know, how to have, how to have a healthy life mentally that just hasn't, that has been totally neglected, I think, um, in terms of like the way parents have raised their kids and the way the education system is run. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to, there's a lot to overhaul. Well, so how did you come to the place of having such a healthy self-worth that you're able to put together a, a, a learning system like this and help others? Um, <laughs> it's a good question. I think that, I think it's a product of many things. You know, my parents raised me with, to have intellectual curiosity. It's interesting because I grew up in a very religious home. And in some ways, it was unfortunately dogmatic. And so I recognized later on in life the unhealthy aspects of that. But, um, but it was simultaneously, uh, it simultaneously valued intellectual curiosity. And this is sort of the Pandora's box that my parents didn't know that they were opening <laughs> in giving me an education that tried to balance both of those two things. Because what that means is to live, to, to, be, to be educated in a, tradition that combines both orthodoxy and inquiry there's both tension between those two things but also a balance between those two things and so um, being able to feel comfortable in questioning orthodoxy but still having a respect for orthodoxy I think made me inclined to um, number one to, to, to be able to find patterns in different aspects of the culture where other people aren't necessarily able to see that so so obviously um mm -hmm. that's number one and number two uh to to be privy to the idea of archetype it's just na it's just a natural thing that came out of like how i was raised in my upbringing i think um and so all all of these things combined to to you know create the person that I am today. And I'm still a person who's constantly developing, constantly learning, constantly evolving. I'm sure 10 years from now, I'll be a different person as well as this natural progression of living. Um, but I think I just became comfortable with, on, on some level, I became comfortable with the unknown because I, I did have to question my upbringing at some point. And I did have to encounter the, I did have to like really wrestle with the fact of my mortality and, I really did go through that stage in college where I like really wrestled with that existentially. And, you know, Peterson talks about how Tolstoy did this. He, he, he points out some passages where Tolstoy thought Tolstoy had to wrestle with his, like the existential anxiety of being alive, knowing that you're going to die one day. Um, and I, I went through that in college. So I think that all of these things contributed to an emotional maturity that I hope to be able to, um, you know, to spread throughout the world. <laughs> well, how is your project going? Are, are you, are you gaining traction? Do you, do it you... is. Yeah. It's really growing, which is really exciting. There are a lot more people finding it now. And it's interesting because it's, it's one of those things that actually thrives in crisis, right? Cause like I was doing this since 2018 and once COVID-19 happened, all of a sudden things really started happening in terms of people becoming aware of theory of enchantment, people buying and enrolling in a theory of enchantment course, far more people have enrolled post COVID or, you know, um, than, than pre COVID. And again, I think it's because I am, because of some of the experiences that I've had in my life, I know what it's like to encounter cognitive dissonance. And I know what it's like to realize that the way I thought that the world worked is not the way the world works. And I think that a lot of people went through that experience for the first time when COVID-19 hit. And so Theory of Enchantment was equipped and is equipped to help people deal with that. And that's a part of life, right? Right? Chaos. We're always on the brink of chaos, which is something that a lot of people, I would say most people don't realize. We're always on the precipice of a rude awakening. This is a nature of the human condition. 